with the tape recorder, Bert. Are you going to tap the telephone? Who, me? Oh, no, Tech, nothing like that. Actually, I've just been trying to record some cases of vibration on cars. You know how confusing vibrations can sometimes be? I've got a hunch that Bert's going to record everything we say so as he can hold it against us. <laughs> that won't surprise me, Tony. But if he's really recording vibrations, I'm definitely interested. Huh? Why the sudden interest in vibrations? Because vibrations produce noise, Tony. And sometimes it's not so easy to locate the source of vibrations. You're so right, Tech. All too often, a vibration diagnosis is made without proper testing. A technician jumps to conclusions or goes out on a limb with a customer. I've seen a lot of parts replaced and still the condition wasn't corrected. I don't get it. A vibration's like any noise that just needs quieting down, isn't it? No, Tony. That's just one of the problems. Now you tell them, Bert. Well, a vibration means there's movement. If the movement's fast enough, it produces a sound you can hear. In fact, all sounds are the result of vibration. Yeah, Tony. You know what happens when a pebble is tossed into a pond. Waves are set up. That's how sound acts, too. The vibrating diaphragm of an auto horn sets up sound waves, and you hear the horn. You can actually get a picture of sound waves on an oscilloscope. That's an electronic instrument that sound engineers use. It tells you how fast the vibrations are, how loud the sound is, and so on. How fast does something have to vibrate before you can hear it? Well, at least 16 cycles per second, Tony. And the rate of vibration is called the frequency. Now, that's a picture of a very low-pitched note. At the other end of the scale, you can hear vibrations up to about 15,000 cycles per second. That's a very high pitch. The faster the frequency, the higher the note. That should give you a clue. Generally, if you hear a high pitch, look for something that's vibrating fast. A low pitch usually means something is vibrating slowly. Tech's right. Now, besides vibrations you can hear, there are those you can feel. Something vibrating too slowly to hear, huh? That's the idea. Suppose an owner uses his brakes severely or hits a curb occasionally or some large chuck holes. Now, that often causes his tires to wear unevenly. Uneven tire wear, in turn, can cause a vibration. The springs damp out some of it, so do the shocks. The frame absorbs more. The seat cushions and springs a little more. But whatever is left, the driver feels through the seat of his pants. It may not be enough to bother him all at once. Other times, it may be enough to cause slight discomfort. I only use the example to show you how vibrations can be telegraphed through the car. And the funny ways that vibrations are telegraphed make it hard to pinpoint the cause. Right. Sometimes it sounds like it's coming from underfoot, say, uh, the transmission or torque converter. Actually, it may come from somewhere in the engine compartment. I'm beginning to see what you're driving at, Bert. So whether you hear it or feel it, it's still going to take some troubleshooting. That's the ticket. Even when you hear and feel it, it's not always easy to find. Sometimes there are sympathetic vibrations. That's when one vibrating part causes another part somewhere else to vibrate. Golly, it can really get complicated, huh? Yeah, it sure can. But the most confusing thing about vibrations is not what people hear, but how they describe what they hear. Now, one customer I remember came in and reported a squeal. Was he right? In his own mind, he was. But the vibration to me sounded more like a squeak. To someone else, it might have sounded like a scream. Squeal, squeak, scream, scream. What's the difference? It's still a noise, isn't it? Hey, you're missing the point, the boy. Now, why don't you put on a silencer, open your ears, and let Bert give you the story? <laughs> well, what Tech and I are getting at, Tony, is that there are a lot of common names for vibrations. And because people interpret the same sound differently, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Customers and technicians talk about a grunt, a groan, a rumble, or a thump. All different words, yet they all might be talking about the same vibration. So what's the answer? A road test, my boy. A road test with the owner in the car. To be sure you know exactly what condition he has in mind. Right. And when you go out with a customer, drive on a smooth blacktop road if possible. On that type of road, it's easier to pick out vibrations because there isn't as much other noise. But before we spell out how to road test a car, suppose we listen to some vibrations I've recorded. I'll uh, hook up the oscilloscope, too, and we can see the frequency patterns as well. Suits me. 
Good, now. I've got a recording of a rear axle whine to listen to. It's an example of a vibration occasionally heard on acceleration. It could be caused by pinion to ring gear tooth contact or by the pinion shaft bearings. Let's listen to how it sounds. Increases in pitch as power speed increases. Let's play it back again. Sounds like a whine to me, all right. And you couldn't miss how that rear axle whine kept getting higher in pitch. It went right on up the scale. You'll know that vibration if you ever hear it. Yep, but I was wondering. You said that it came in on acceleration. Couldn't it come in on deceleration? Yeah, it sure could. But the whine would get lower in pitch instead of higher as the car slows down. You'll get a whine on either acceleration or deceleration, but not on both. If there were a noise on both, it would be more of a growl than a whine. The main source in this case would be carrier bearings rather than gear teeth. Hey, that's interesting. Have you got anything else on that tape contraption? Yeah, Tony, I have another one, and it's a doozy. Uh-oh. I don't like the way you say that. <laughs> well, I'm talking about a beat noise. It's a rhythmic kind of vibration. It comes in at regular intervals when the car is driven at a constant speed. Yeah, Tony. And it's not the easiest vibration to diagnose and correct. That's right. A lot of things enter into a beat noise. It's usually caused by two or more vibrations. So let's play back a prop shaft vibration, sometimes heard at high speeds. Listen. That vibration is at a certain frequency. Now, here's another vibration at a different frequency. There, you've heard two different tones, one at a time. Now, when you hear both of them at the same time, they form what is known as a beat noise. Let's listen. Golly, sure sounds like a beat, all right. I won't have trouble picking that one out. Uh, maybe not, Tony. But that beat noise doesn't always sound like that. That's right. I've got another beat example, part of which comes from the prop shaft vibration, and it sounds entirely different. Here, let me play it for you so you can tell the difference. Listen. change? A change in car speed? No. No, that was a beat at a constant car speed. But, because it was a different combination of vibrations, at a certain period, the vibrations cancel each other out. Then they get out of step, make the beat, and then cancel out again. Well, I can sure see that there's a lot to this vibration business. That there is. A regular beat noise can really get on your nerves. So if you ever hear this type of vibration, be sure to make very careful tests. But before we talk about those tests, fellas, 
Somebody please turn this record over. Now, one of the vibrations in each of the beat examples you heard was coming from the prop shaft. We found that out by making extensive road tests. So, suppose we talk about how you road test to track down a vibration condition. Okay, where do you start? Well, with the owner, Tony. Let him drive. Ask him to drive at the speed or in the manner that brings in the vibration. Get him to point out the condition so you'll know exactly what he's got in mind. I see. And no matter what he calls it, we'll still know what he wants corrected. That's the idea. But here's one thing to remember. Concentrate on only the condition the owner is pointing out. If you recognize other conditions which may be more objectionable, make mental notes to correct them later. But don't confuse the owner who is trying to demonstrate some other noise. Once you agree to correct a condition, you admit that something's wrong. That puts the monkey on your back. Then the owner expects you to eliminate that condition 100%. What the owner might be concerned about could be something most drivers accept as normal. It may even be a vibration that's impossible to minimize. In a case like this, if you're positive it's a normal operating vibration and isn't going to cause trouble, explain it to the owner. Then he'll know the cause and will no longer worry about it. I see. Play it safe until you get all the facts. Yeah, but be sure to put the customer at ease. He's mighty worried or he wouldn't have come in. He might feel that the vibration could result in greater damage. Tech's right. Our job is to make sure we understand what's to be corrected, and then, if it's not a normal condition, assure the owner we'll try our best to find the cause and see what we can do about it. I think I understand. A kind of selling job. Yes, sir. -y. We keep him sold on the product, sell him into a better frame of mind, and protect ourselves at the same time. Usually, if you take time to explain what's behind the vibration, the owner accepts your explanation and is satisfied. He no longer listens for the condition because he knows no harm will come from it. On the other hand, once we know it's not a normal condition, and we have an idea of what we have to go after, then we can make further tests to narrow down the possible sources. I think I know what you mean by finding out what to shoot for, but further tests? You kind of lose me there. Well, look, Tony, maybe this will help. First, you road test with the owner. Find out if the vibration's normal or not. If not, you then road test further without the owner to pinpoint the source to either the engine or chassis. Okay, but how can you be sure whether it is engine or chassis? Well, your overall road test should point out certain clues. For example, when I start out on a road test, I always connect a tachometer to the engine. Bring the instrument inside the car where you can watch it. Then drive the car and observe the engine RPM at which a vibrating condition appears. In many cases, there's a definite connection. Uh-huh. Hook up a portable tack. Good thing to remember. All right. Now, as you road test the car, get an answer to this basic question. Is the condition present while the car is in motion? Besides that, Find out if the condition comes in at any particular car speed or is present regardless of speed. Yeah, use the tachometer too. Tie in the condition to engine speed and to car speed. Good point, Tech. Then, if the vibration occurs at a particular car speed, can you drive through the noise on acceleration? And if you do drive through it, can you get the same vibration on deceleration at the same car speed? Both tests are important. I see. We've got to know if the condition shows up only on acceleration or if we can get the same vibration on deceleration. Yeah, and in addition to that, get the car up above the speed where the condition occurs. Shift to neutral, let the engine run at idle speed, then coast down through the speed at which a vibration occurred to see if the condition's still noticeable. That's one good way to separate engine from chassis sources, Tony. Shift to neutral and then coast. If the vibration is still there, it is not from the engine. Yeah, I can see that. Fine. Now, it also pays to see if you can bring in the same condition while the engine's running and the car is standing still. Good point, Bert. And remember, run the engine at the same RPM as the tack showed when the vibration came in while the car was moving. Another check is to see if the vibration is tied in with each wheel revolution. If so, it might be only a tire bump or a wheel assembly out of balance. I see. Well, I've had some experience with tire noise and wheel assembly balance. 
I can handle that all right. I'm sure you can, my boy. Just remember, when you're running down a vibration condition, do a thorough job of testing. Try to isolate the condition to a general area. When you know what units are not related to the vibration, you can concentrate on those that might be responsible. As an example, suppose you're sure the vibration's coming from the engine. Your next step would be to eliminate parts of the engine. Yeah, Tony, you uh, might disconnect the fan belt and run the engine at the speed where the condition was present. I got you. That would tell us if the fan, water pump, or generator were involved. That's right. And if running with the belt off didn't bring in the vibration, install a belt that drives only the generator to see if that's the cause. A further test would be to remove the fan blades and leave the fan belt in place. If the vibration's gone, it means the fan blades were responsible. I get the general idea. Well, that's fine. Now, when it comes to isolating chassis vibrations, more tests are involved. Take that uh, prop shaft vibration we mentioned before. Oh, yeah. How'd you decide it was the prop shaft? Well, our road tests ruled out the engine. We noticed the vibration came in at the same car speed, whether the transmission was in low or direct drive. That made us suspect the prop shaft. Some overspray from undercoating can unbalance the prop shaft, Tony. The wrong angularity at the rear joint can make it vibrate, too. That's right. And angularity is an easy thing to fix. With a spirit level protractor, see if the rear joint operates inside an angle of 5 to 7 degrees. If necessary, install shims to bring angularity inside those limits. Okay, Bert. That's pretty clear. You'll find more information on prop shaft angularity and tracking down chassis vibrations in this reference book, Tony. Okay, Tech. I'll be sure to read that book over. And keep in mind the way vibrations are often telegraphed through the car, Tony. Don't worry. You won't catch me replacing a prop shaft, muffler, or any other part before I complete my tests. Fine. And remember this. Different roads may be a factor. So find out on what kind of road surface the owner notices the vibration. Then... Test the car on the same kind of road. Frequently, certain roads scramble sounds together so that you can't pick out the vibration. Then, when you get out on a smooth blacktop, zingo, there it is. Okay, Bert, you've sold me. I can see that tracking down vibrations properly is important. A guy could go way off the deep end if he didn't get all the facts. Yes, he could, Tony. So, road test with the owner, then by yourself. If it's not normal, Isolate the condition to engine or chassis. Narrow down the area, and you'll simplify the job every time. Not only that, you'll keep the owner sold on the car, and you'll keep him sold on our service. We need both to keep us going. <laughs>